So I'm very happy to be here. My topic is to talk about the importance of uh, decentralization. Do we all believe that decentralization is very important? Yes? Who here agrees that decentralization is very important to the future of society? Yes, that's why I'm very happy to be here. So in essence, my thinking is that decentralization, even though the word has been in the dictionary for many, many years, I actually didn't understand or learn about the word until just in the last few years since learning about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Is that also the truth with you? Yes? It's very important because prior to Bitcoin, very few things were actually decentralized. In fact, many things were centralized. And that's why the centralized authorities, governments, companies, they don't want to talk too much about the fact that they have everything under control. So we're going to talk about decentralization from the, from the perspective of ownership, from the perspective of control, and ultimately from the perspective of freedom, freedom in society, whatever you want to do. Okay, what is ownership? Who here understands ownership? Do all of you own something? Yes? You have, you, you have ownership? Do you truly have ownership? What I challenge is the concept of ownership. So today, ownership is actually identity. Today, everything, the vast majority of what you own is actually through your identity, through your name, through your passport. We're talking about if you own real estate, if you own a home, if you own an apartment, if you own stocks and bonds. Do some of you trade stocks in Russia? There's a, there's a stock market here, healthy? Yes? No one, no one trades stocks here, <laughs> unlike in China. Uh, do you, you must have money in your bank account. So all of your bank accounts, your brokerage, stocks accounts, your real estate, even your cars, your motorcycles are owned under your name. If you lose track of your identity, if someone steals your identity, they can steal your assets and goods. In the old days, it wasn't like that. In the past, ownership was about possession, about holding it. If you own something, you have it in your hands. And that's true with all the food you have in your home. It's true with the gold and silver necklaces. Your wealth is what you can hold. And that's why you would, hi if you have a big home, you would hire people to guard your home. In the old days in Europe, they have castles. The owners of the castles would hire soldiers to guard the castles. Because if you don't guard it, someone can come and invade and take your home away. So that's the past. Ownership is through possession. Today, because ownership is through identity, everything is centralized. Think about it. Everything you own of value, more than a few hundred dollars, a few thousand rubles, is most, most likely it is owned under your name. Is that true? Do you guys agree? Yes? Let me see you raise your hand. Yes? It's owned under your name, right? So I'm glad you have your identity, you have your national ID or your passport. But the problem with ownership by name is that someone else has control. Someone else, the bank is holding your assets. The, these brokerage accounts for your securities, for your stocks, they're holding your stocks and securities. The government is issuing you title to your land, to your home, to your real estate, but it, ultimately they have control. If you break the law, if they don't like you, they can deny you. Even something simple, like a plane ticket. I flew here from Barcelona. The plane ticket was reserved in my name, Bobby Lee. If I'm on the blacklist, they will not let me fly. If my name is spelled differently in the passport than in the reservation system, they will not let me fly. For all these reasons, whenever ownership is through identity, you actually do not have control. Someone else is in control. And they like it. 
they like being in control because they can make more money off of you. What is control? Control of what exactly are we talking about? Let's go through some examples. Control of your accounts. All of you have bank accounts, stocks accounts, even online payments. In, in the Western world, we see uh, in the Uni United States, there's PayPal, Venmo. In China, there's WeChat Pay, there's Alipay. All of these accounts, your credit card accounts, everything is under your name. Control of your money. Your money in the bank accounts, they have control over. So think about, this is a picture of people lining up to get money from Cyprus in 2013. I heard a lot of Russian people has, have money in Cyprus. Is that true? It's my first time in, uh, in Russia. I want to find out for real. Is it true that a lot of Russian people had money in Cyprus bank accounts before 2013? Anyone want to tell me who, or is it very private? <laughs> so if you had money in Cyprus, what happened is the euros there, the banks, because of the government had a budget crisis, a budget deficit, they decided to take a haircut off of the people with money in the, in the Cyprus. So your euros, this is a $500 euro note, your euros in Cyprus had to have a 10% haircut. They, they just took it away. And, it's, and in the end, people revolted. So people went to line up at ATMs and get as much money out as possible. Because all of a sudden, the euros in a Cyprus bank account was worth less than a euro in a German bank account. So this is terrible. Also, the control of the value of money. Not just the money itself, but the value of money. So this is 500 euro. Many people don't get to see this. This is the largest euro bill. The value of this today, if I go exchange it for Russian ruble, I can get a lot of, buy a lot of food, buy a lot of goods and services, buy plane tickets. But the value actually has been depreciating over much time. We see it live. So we have some images of post-war Germany, German marks losing value. We have, we have uh, Zimbabwe dollars losing lots of value, hyperinflation. This is 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. We also have examples more modern, um, like India, two years ago, they banned the 501,000 rupee note. They changed it out, they just, they changed it out. There's, of course, um, in fact, India is recently losing more value. The Indian, um, the rupee has, a, has a lost, I think, 17% of its value this year alone. It's crazy, the money is just going down in value. The Chinese renminbi has lost value as well, 5%, 10%, and also uh, Venezuela, the Bolivar has lost money, Argentina pesos losing money. Uh, how is the Russian ruble doing? Is it holding up? But in fact, fiat money, the reason we lose value is because they print too much of it. It's centralized money. Anything that's centralized, it becomes, it'll go down to nothing, right? So this is, what you see here is 500, ru 500 euros. And I have a question for everyone. What is, what fiat banknote is the, is there a fiat ban banknote that would never depreciate in value? So I was in Barcelona, in Monte Carlo, Monaco, last week, and I found a European banknote that would never depreciate in value. It's actually this one. It's the, it's the zero euro. So if you go vacation in Europe, you can get this, zero euro. I'm not, I'm not kidding, this is for real. And um, so the Europeans are very smart. The ECB, European Central Bank, is very smart. This is the ultimate because this on here, it says exactly what it is. It's zero euro where every banknote will go to zero. Uh, but unfortunately, they're also very smart. They sell this as tourist attraction. I have to pay three euros for this note. So it already says it, it'll never go down zero. So, so uh, certainly don't waste all your money buying these because uh, then, then you'll go bankrupt even faster. Okay, they also control your points. Think about, um, I fly airlines in the United States, there's an airline called United Airlines. Many airlines have reward points, mileage plus, sky miles, you know, one world, 
So those points, they all control. They limit how much you can redeem. They limit how much you can transfer. They limit how much you can use. Even, con even points in gift cards, points in hotel rewards. If you stay at Marriott Hotel, Hilton Hotel, you have reward points. All of those systems are centralized and they control. That's how it is. Nothing wrong with those systems, but I'm pointing out that they always have control. In the future, we are in the future, you will regain control. All of you, all of us here will regain control through the notion of digital assets, cryptocurrency, private keys. We are in a digital age today, and we're getting decentralization from something called math, from something called cryptography, which is essentially mathematics. And the reason we have decentralization from mathematics and cryptography is because mathematics is universal. I don't care what country you grew up in, any country you go to school, you learn math. Math is universal, it transcends all languages. I know Russians here are very smart. A lot of great mathematicians and scientists come from Moscow, come from Russia, right? Also in China, very smart people, also a lot of people starting from a young age, learning math. And same in Europe and many countries as well. So mathematics is actually, if you think of it as a language, it's the, the language and the system that transcends all cultures and it's, it's used by all people on the, uh, in the world. And that's how we get decentralization in cryptocurrency and blockchain, is through mathematics because private keys, the private keys you own for your digital wallets Essentially, these are the passwords, very, very long passwords. So, ownership of currency, let's see, what's it, oops, yeah. Ownership of currency came to us for the first time in 2009 through Bitcoin. Before Bitcoin, all the money you owned, it doesn't matter if you have a lot of money or very little money, it was always in bank accounts, in stocks, in real estate, in bonds, and these were all controlled by other people. Even if you own gold and silver, if you left it in a safe deposit box at a bank that's also controlled by the bank, they might give you a key, but one day you show up, they might take your gold away. I remember history many years ago, gold gets confiscated. Even in the United States of America, about 100 years ago, the country, the national government of the United States confiscated all of the gold from all of its people. And they forced them to take these US dollars in return. And as soon as they confiscated it, gold price jumped up 20%. So with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for the first time, and this is only if you hold the private keys, okay? So not hosted wallets, not leaving on exchanges. If you actually hold the private keys, in a digital wallet, either a paper wallet or a hardware wallet, or download the software on your own computer, then for the first time you have ownership of real assets. So Bitcoin represents the true new asset class, a digital asset class that is for freedom. It is a decentralized nature of the technology of Bitcoin that allows you to own and control that Bitcoin. At lunch today, I was talking to a delegate and we talked about how difficult it is still. That is very much true. Today, in 2018, it is still very, very difficult for most of people to actually own digital assets because the knowledge is not there. People did not go to school, did not go to college, learning about digital currencies. But I remember when I was young, in grade school, I would learn about money. At the time, the teachers give us, show us examples of real money, of coins and paper notes. I think this next generation, your children and your grandchildren, will go to school and learn about digital currencies and decentralization. I think this is the future. Of course, Bitcoin is important because it's limited to 21 million units. It's all based on information and math. There's nothing physical or tangible. The whole network is on the internet the whole blockchain. 
It's borderless and global. That's what I love. Everywhere I go these days, people, people, if they recognize me, they understand that I'm in the Bitcoin blockchain industry. They don't have to be Chinese or American. They don't have to be men or women. They don't have to be young or old. They can be everything. Anyone who understands blockchain, Bitcoin, they don't even have to speak my language. They understand it. This is, this is what I truly love about it. I see myself as a citizen of the earth, as a global citizen. And the reason is because I don't, people ask me, Bobby, where are you from? And I always hesitate to answer the question because it's very complicated for me. I'll just share with you my personal story. My parents are, of course, Chinese. You can imagine from Shanghai and then Hong Kong. So when I was born, I had a Hong Kong passport. But I was not born in China or Hong Kong. I was born in Africa, uh, in the country called Cote d'Ivoire. Ivory Coast. Anyone from Cote d'Ivoire here? My parents also grew up and lived in Ghana, in Accra. So I, I, I was born in Africa and I went to American school, international school, which is why I learned this uh, American English. I also spoke French because Ivory Coast was a French nation, French colony before 1960. And I spoke Chinese at home. So now uh, when, I, when I see my American friends, I tell them I am Chinese African American. So I, I am, I am almost Chinese African American. So it's true, that's what I truly love about Bitcoin because it's really global. It makes me feel like at home uh, being a citizen of, of the earth. So it's not identity based. Many central bankers, authorities, regulators hate, they hate it. They hate the fact that Bitcoin is not tied to identity. When citizens, when we own Bitcoin, when we have Bitcoin in accounts, they can, the governments cannot tell who owns it. They cannot tell when the Bitcoins go back and forth. They hate it. Why do they hate it? Because they want control. And Bitcoin was designed, it was made to not have identity because with identity, there's always control. Think about that. When there's identity, someone has to make a judgment. Are you who you are? When I go to the airport yesterday at Barcelona, or even yesterday when I arrived in Moscow, I show them my passport, you know, visa or no visa. They have to say, are you really Bobby? The passport, there's a photo. In the future, there's biometrics, fingerprints, iris scanning. Someone has to judge whether you are who you are, whether it was a passport, ID card, airline ticket, right? At least so far today, movie theaters. Do you watch movies? Do you, like, do you guys like movies? Yes? Do they require ID at movie theaters? Yes? No? No, not yet. Maybe one day they will, because in China now, airline tickets, even you travel by train, you need ID. You use a Wi-Fi, you need ID. You have a mobile phone, you need ID. In China, everything, you need ID. And it's a way to exert control. So because Bitcoin has no ID identification when you use it, there's no third party control. This is very, very important. Okay. So decentralization of money is all about ownership. By having decentralized money, it gives all of us real ownership of our assets. Without real ownership of our money, who are we working for? Think about that. All, all of us, unless we're born rich, unless we're born into the wealthy class, all of us have to go to school and then learn how to work and then we work for, for a living. We bring, we work, we make money, we rent a home, we buy a home, we bring food to our family, we raise our family. When we work, we get paid wages. The money that we work hard for, that money, we have to be able to freely spend it. If we're not able to freely spend it, then essentially it's slavery. I think, I think the definition of slavery down the road will be revised to talk about whether the person has true freedom of their money. So what is the impact of decentralized money? It's freedom in society. With decentralized money, with true decentralization, with that kind of freedom, you have true freedom in society. Now I understand not every country has true freedom and that's, you know, that's how the world is. Some countries are more free than others, but I want to you know, regardless of what country I am in, I live in China, I grew up in the US, 
now I'm a dual citizen, China, uh, Hong Kong, and the United States. So I'm also in this, uh, in this, you know, uh, balance of freedom and no freedom. Um, but at least we could talk about it, which is my belief is that a truly free society has to give you freedom of money. Okay. So I hope that with, uh, in the decentralian economy, there's freedom of money. So let's talk about information, money as information. We talked about private keys. Let's, let me, let me see this, ask a real question here. And this goes back to earlier about how easy or how difficult it is to use Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. How many of you, I assume that many of you own crypto assets and cryptocurrencies. Is that right? Yes, let's see, raise your hand. All of you have it? Yes, many of you? If you don't, maybe you should raise your hand and say, I want some, right? Okay, so how many of you actually have your digital currencies in your own digital wallets where you have the private keys? How many of you have possession of your own private keys? Oh, a lot. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. A lot of you have. However, many of you who don't raise your hand, it's because you probably have your digital currencies at a hosted wallet or on an exchange. Is that right? Which is fine, but you have to understand the risk. You're depending on someone else to hold your money. Now, the great thing about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is it's just information. It's just ones and zeros. What I showed you here is ones and zeros binary. I showed you a million dollars. I'm giving you a million dollars. Is that possible? It's possible, but not likely. I'm not, I'm not uh, that rich or that generous. So, but I will give out some money today because what happens is with, with digital information, information is money. So I give this talk, I show a hundred dollar U hundred dollar bill, United States USD hundred dollar bill. How many of you would like a hundred dollars? Any of you? Are you ready? So, so it's hard for me to give out a hundred dollars because first of all, we're in Russia. So I want to give out rubles. How about 10,000 rubles? Yes. So in this account, this is a Bitcoin account that has 10,000 Russian rubles in it. If you scan it, you check it, 1DS6QG all the way down to UP4E, this is a Bitcoin account on a public blockchain that has 10,000 rubles worth of Bitcoin. Is that a lot of money? Is that enough to pay for dinner? Yeah? You would like it? 10,000 rubles. So I'm going to give this away. The way I give it away is by giving the private key. Here it is, the private key. It starts with L3QE2 and ends in 568DQ. So this is a QR code. So this private key in there on the Bitcoin blockchain corresponds to that account. It's the password for that account. So if you've never seen it before, here you go. Here is a real account with 10,000 rubles worth of Bitcoin and here's a private key. For those of you who are good with math, good with technology, you're taking a photo, you're scanning it, you can actually retrieve 10,000 rubles. Anyone have it? Did anyone get it yet? Your last chance. Are you ready? I'm going to move to the next slide, then no more, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, let me tell you a funny story. Um, I actually had to update this slide because I, I used the same QR code from a different presentation and I loaded in 10,000 uh, 10, rubles this morning. And because someone else out there had the private key from my last presentation, they stole the money right away. Someone, someone took the money right away. So I had to update the slides to put another 10,000 rubles into this account. And this time it's your chance to take it, okay? So if you take it, raise your hand, okay? Tell me after the talk that you got the 10,000 ruble, okay? All right, so decentralized money is money in the cloud. Decentralization is very important because we really want money to be in the cloud. We don't want money to be managed by any single government or any single central bank. Not that banks and central banks or governments are bad, but because you risk them doing something you don't like. Whether it's printing excess money, whether it's budget deficits, whether it's trade wars, all things that can take your value away. When the money is in the cloud, in the blockchain, when you have the private key, they cannot take it away. Okay, 
Decentralization allows everyone, all of us here, to own real assets without surrendering control because we have the private key. Now, if you want to, you can share your private keys and give it away like I did. But at least it gives you the choice to not ever give it away. And there's also plausible deniability. You can say, I don't own it because you don't have the private key. So um, we're near the end of my talk. I have about seven minutes left. I'm gonna share with you some additional thoughts about Bitcoin. Would you like that? Okay, so why will the price go up? Today the price is low. With Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all the cryptocurrencies and tokens, the price is low today. Well, I truly believe the price will go up more in the future because Bitcoin's value does not come from the endorsement, acceptance, nor the regulation by governments. Think about that. The value of Bitcoin is not sanctioned or given status by the government. Rather, Bitcoin's value comes from the inherent, the natural failures, limitations, and inconveniences of the money system we use today. The fiat money, I don't care if it's 500 euros or zero euro, it has major problems. Recently, I live in Shanghai in China. Recently, I had to fly to Hong Kong for one day just to go do a bank transfer because the bank will not transfer my money. In fact, I had to transfer the money to my own account in the United States. I transferred from my Hong Kong bank to my United States bank and they won't do it for me unless I show up in front of a branch teller. So I had to fly from Shanghai to Hong Kong to process that bank transfer. Otherwise, they won't do it. So for these reasons, the money we use today has many, many problems. And for hundreds of years, these problems were not solved by technology. But today, in the 10th year of cryptocurrency of Bitcoin, we finally have the technologies called the blockchain, called proof of work, called Bitcoin, that can solve the problem. In the future, you and I and our children will never have to go fly to another country just to make a bank transfer. But today, people routinely do that. For many of you who own businesses, who run large companies, who do large transactions with banks, you know what I mean. You have to go in front of a bank officer, sign on the paper, and to process a bank wire transfer. So, the fiat money system. Okay, that was slow. All right. So, um, we talk about money laundering. Would you like that topic? And anyone want to hear about money laundering? Or should I skip this slide? Yeah? Yeah, it takes one to know one. You and I, we like money laundering, right? <laughs> okay, no, that's a joke. Of course not. Um, but the question is genuine. Is money laundering bad? Today, I ask people, everyone says, oh, money laundering is bad. It's illegal. It's criminal activity. It's bad. Don't do money laundering. All the banks, compliance officers say money laundering is bad. But I challenge them. I say, I, my philosophy, this is a new philosophy, I think that governments in the future should not criminalize transactions. And the reason is not because whether money laundering is good or bad, it's because in the future, with cryptocurrencies, it will be impossible to trace where the payments go from and to. Think about that. I already see it. I envision a future, not because I want it, but because the technology is there. You just cannot be possible to penalize money transfers because most of that in the future will be done digitally over the blockchain in cryptocurrency. Many of that will be anonymous or pseudo-anonymous or semi-anonymous. That's why I think in the future we should have the banks and the compliance people save the money, save the budget, and use the money to give to the police, the FBI, the Secret Service, to really go after the criminals for the criminal activity, but not go after the people who just send money back and forth. Okay? So that, that's, my, uh, that's my recommendation. So please prepare for a war on freedom. With Bitcoin, this year and next year, we're starting to see regulators and banks and countries really come down hard on Bitcoin. They don't want to lose control. The governments do not want to lose control. That's why they're gonna try everything to block quick, uh, Bitcoin blockchain. They're gonna make it illegal, right? In Russia, is it illegal now to own Bitcoin or is it not illegal? 
Yes? No? But there are many rumors in the past that Russia banned Bitcoin. Am I right? Same in China. China like banned Bitcoin like four times already. So it's, it's crazy. All these countries, maybe Thailand, maybe Indonesia, maybe um, Argentina, Venezuela, they would try to ban Bitcoin. And maybe even the United States, even the European Union would try to ban Bitcoin. Many countries, many governments will try and uh, declare war on money. So governments worldwide will do more and more to suppress Bitcoin, but Bitcoin was designed to survive. It was designed to be decentralized. Okay, that's the key thing. The solution is to have a currency that's decentralized so that no one, not even the creator, can turn it off. None of us know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, the creator of Bitcoin. But if Satoshi Nakamoto were here and, I, and we all begged him to turn it off, he cannot turn it off. He does not have the master key. That's the, that's the true thing about Bitcoin. So, so let's go quickly. Um, a few things about how to invest, how to hodl Bitcoin, how to hold Bitcoin. So there's some mistakes to avoid, okay? Uh, have you been investing in Bitcoin for many years? If you have, maybe you've made some of these mistakes. Let's look at these top four mistakes to avoid, okay? So by applause, I want to see if you agree with me or if you've made that mistake. Are you guys ready? We're going to applause if you agree or if you've made this mistake. Number one mistake is indecisiveness to make an investment. Meaning you learn about Bitcoin but you forgot to buy it. Yes? All right. This is a table here. Very, uh, very early adopters forgot to buy Bitcoin. Me too. I didn't, I didn't get to buy Bitcoin when I, uh, when I first learned about it. Number two mistake is not buying enough. How many of you made that mistake? Or is it just me? <laughs> not, <laughs> not buying enough. Okay. Number three mistake is selling after a small gain. So you buy Bitcoin, it goes up 20%, 30%, it doubles your money, and you sell your Bitcoin. Yes? Yes? My friends bought Bitcoin at 100 US dollars. They sold it at 300 US dollars. They tripled their money. But that's actually a very small gain because Bitcoin is over $6,000 today. Okay? So remember, if you do buy Bitcoin, don't ever sell it after a small gain. And the last mistake is selling Bitcoin during a panic crash. It could be Bitcoin, it could be cryptocurrencies, okay? So any of you have sold after panic crash? When people say, oh, China banned Bitcoin, everybody sell, 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 sell. When Russia bans Bitcoin, sell, 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 right? So don't make that mistake, okay? All right, so thank you very much. This is my talk. What, one more thing is, uh, if you add me on Twitter as a follower, my number of followers on Twitter is my long-term, mid-term price prediction for Bitcoin. And uh, so the more people who add me, then the higher my price target for Bitcoin is. These four mistakes. Next one, this one. Yes, so this one is, uh, is my conclusion. Is, is basically, I talk about decentralization. Uh, it's through the notion of ownership, control, and freedom because it affects how we own things, digital currencies, it affects the fact that many of the old governments and the states and the central banks, they have control of us, the companies, and we're taking control back for ourselves. And finally, it's about freedom. It's about having the control of our money and freedom. Okay, thank you very much, my time is up.